Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is a Labour MP based in Hamilton. I'd like to welcome Jamie Strange. How are you cool. doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, Reese. Yeah, had 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 a good morning. I was up early uh, watching my team, Man City, lose to Liverpool in controversial fashion. Oh, nice. But are you anyway. one of those people that throws stuff at the screen? <laughs> I managed to control myself, but um, <laughs> it was a bit frustrating. <laughs> so I'm always interested in why someone chooses to get into politics like mm. what's the reason for it because from what i understand you you were a teacher beforehand yeah yeah that's right yep so my, my um two main professions um have have, have been um, youth worker yeah um and teacher and so uh, i guess if you add a third being mp it's uh, they are quite similar in terms of people so yep. uh, i guess my whole life i've sort of always thought you know how can i help people how you know how can i be altruistic how can i sort of um you know, bring some good to the world. Yeah. And obviously, through being a youth leader and being a teacher, that the, the big, big motivation. Um, back in 2013, uh, I, I I got interested in politics. I I, I think the key reason was um, uh, when my wife and I um, um, had, had our children. We got four kids. And wow. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we we had four and five years, so um, that was a bit silly. I wouldn't wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but we but we had four under five. Uh, and and that hands down was the, was the number one biggest um, uh, the number one thing that impacted my life um, in, in the biggest way and it and it made me it made me sort of think I mean even though I sort of thought I was pretty altruistic it sort of made me realize oh okay maybe I am a bit more self absorbed than I realized but when you have kids you know everything's about them really that's the story I've heard yeah yeah, yeah exactly so yeah it, it, it sort of becomes you know about them which is good which is healthy and so you know I started thinking about you know what will the world be like for them when they grow up you know, will, will they afford, be able to afford to buy a house um, will there be a good education health system for them um, uh, what, what will the state of the planet be like um, you know in, in terms of climate mm. change and so I sort of started thinking a little bit long term and um, and yeah and, and felt that I sort of wanted to take a little bit of leadership in that area yeah yeah so in regards to that, what are some of the things you feel needs to be improved, not just mm. within the Waikato, but yeah, in New Zealand yeah. overall? Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, I touched on it before around climate change. I, I think yep. that is the number one issue facing um, facing our planet. Yeah. Uh, previously, you know, the, the big issues have, have tended to be either war or famine. Um, and and they still exist. Yeah, um, yeah. Not so much here. <laughs> no, no. We, we we are pretty blessed in New Zealand. We but, are. We are. But um, yeah. But but I mean, like um, climate change. Um, you know, the the uh, warming planet, and people have various reasons as to why they think it is warming. But the reality is, it is warming. The reality is, um, sea level is rising. Um, and you know, and and um, you know, we're in a very uh. Um, volatile state, and so yeah, I'm 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 particularly proud of the you know the, the work that that the government's been doing on that, and even just on Thursday, um, you know, passing the the uh, climate change bill. So, how much involvement do you actually have in that? In in that specific bill? Yeah, yeah. Not not much myself. Because um, do you do you have much to deal? Uh, much dealings with like Jacinda, like one on one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I meet with Jacinda um, every Tuesday. So every, oh, wow. every Tuesday, our caucus of, of uh, Labour Party MPs, so there, there's 46 of us, um, we, we meet with Jacinda um, on, a, on a Tuesday morning. So uh, basically, I, I fly to Wellington on a Tuesday morning, so I'll head down tomorrow, you know, get up reasonably early, and then, and then, and then first thing Tuesday morning, we have, um, we have our caucus meeting with Jacinda. How, goes, it, how, how long is yeah, it? Yeah, about for? an hour and a half, okay. sometimes two hours. Right. And, and so basically, she, she chairs it, you know, so she yep. gives her report. And then we go through reports from other people, and and, and then we discuss, um, you know, some of the key issues and how we're going to respond to them. Is that all within an hour and a half? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Within a, yeah, hour it doesn't and a half, seem like much hours. time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, her reports normally about a quarter of an hour. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, we can ask questions, you know, um, and we can tease that out, but normally about a quarter of an hour, and then, and then we sort of get into the, um, you know, the the, the business of, of discussing things. Oh. But but I should say the other aspect around getting into politics um, was was around education as well. Yeah, well that's a that's a big big thing. Yeah, yeah, and so I, I I'm a I'm a really big believer in in the power of education. You know, for people to um, uh, uh, basically change their lives. Really, um, you know, ed education creates opportunity. Um, I, I see yourself, you know, like on on the wall there, <laughs> diploma in audio engineering. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, you probably wouldn't be doing this, or you certainly wouldn't be doing this to this quality without 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 that. 
Probably not. No. Do you feel the face of education is changing though, like the evolution of it? Because mm. people have the ability now to educate themselves online through multiple yeah. know, online courses and yeah. so forth, as opposed to going to uni. Mm. Are you for like people doing trade and stuff as well? Oh, certainly. Yeah, certainly. absolutely. That. that um, uh, there's a big shortage of tradespeople, yeah. um, particularly plumbers, um, builders, electricians, uh, and we're 4,000 houses short in Hamilton alone, and, and across the country, you know, we, we've got a sh- we, we've got quite a large shortage. So, we we need tradespeople, you know, to, to help build the houses. But it um, seems like the media is always pushing for you know kids to go to uni. That seems to be what's yeah, in the yeah. media and stuff. I mean, maybe the media. Um, sometimes parents, um, you know, sometimes parents see university as being um, above the trades. Yeah, as a negative stereotype against trades. Yeah. I think sometimes, yeah. yeah. I think that there has been, yeah. But I mean, if you look at career opportunities, if you look at incomes, you know, plenty of people who who live in really nice houses here in Hamilton. Um, and also have a house at the beach and drive a flash car, tradies. Yeah. Um, you know, yep. plumbers, electricians, um, and partly because it, it, there's there's uh, not that many of them. They, they you know they can charge fairly fairly good prices, but also um, you know they've got the, the the opportunity to have have their own business. And yeah. It's, and it's a skill that that we will always need, you know, in various forms. So so certainly education is really important. Um, the interesting thing about education for me across the whole system is that is that teachers are uh, preparing students for jobs that don't exist. Um, well, that's I mean, right. Yeah, I mean, the the uh, job market is is um, changing dramatically, um, quite quickly before our eyes. So, 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 some of those key life skills are important. Yeah. Um, so, uh, particularly um, confidence, uh, creativity, working with people, uh, leadership, uh, entrepreneurship. You know, starting your own business, creating your own um, industry. Uh, yeah. So, it, it is a it is a bit of a challenge for teachers. You know, like I mean, like how do you how how do you practically do that? You know. Yeah, because I'm. I suppose it would would have changed quite a quite a lot just in the short time that you've been out of the game. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like previously, um, I know when I went to school, um, education generally consisted of of a a teacher at the front um, with all the knowledge um, and students sitting there with a you know with a pen in their hand and a book in front of them, and the teacher often talking for sort of you know forty forty minutes, fifty minutes, mm. um, while the students write down notes. And um and and that's and that's it. But um and and university even more that way. And that they call it the sage on the stage. Whereas often what's hap- often what what happens with that style is well certainly it doesn't suit everyone. Yeah. You know. But for a lot of people, they they stop listening after one minute. You know. And Short the teacher talks spans, for forty yeah. minutes, and the teacher the teacher thinks, oh, that was a good session. We got a lot done. You know, but you know, but for quite a few of the students, they just switched off and they just started drawing pictures in their books or something. And, you know, but but when education is um, authentic, um, you know, so linked to to our opportunities out there in the world, um, and when it's and when it's very practical, I think that that's when education is at its best. Do teachers uh, teach the kids much on automation though? Like, is it, does it come up in classrooms? I'm not talking yeah. about primary school or anything, but more in. Uh... High school, I suppose, or even intermediate. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, certainly coding. Um, uh, I I see that talk quite a bit. Coding. Yeah, coding. Yeah, um, and and um, automation. Um, I have seen it in in small cases. Um, I know um, my uh, kids go to a local primary school, and and they teach automation. So, do they know how to code? Yeah, yeah, and they, yeah, and and they do coding. So they basically code robots, and then the robots perform little functions. Do they come home and show you how to do it? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, that they're, they're on the iPad all the time, so hopefully they're doing hopefully something that's constructive. What they're doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that Minecraft is. Um, oh, yeah, my that's, kids that's are still a phenomenon. In Minecraft. Yeah, 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 it's a huge phenomenon that game, and yeah. it's all about building and everything. So yeah, it teaches yeah. kids how to, I suppose, design. Yeah, 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 that's right. But I mean, it's interesting. The the uh, workforce is is changing. Um, you know, with automation. Mm. Um, you know, with uh, yeah. So it, it is difficult to predict what the workforce will look like in sort of um, you know, fifteen, twenty years time. Yeah. Now you've recently started this Grow Waikato event that you yeah. do bi monthly. Mm-hmm. For people that don't know, yeah, it's a bi monthly event where people come and speak about re- various things that happen. Within the Waikato? Mm, yeah. yeah. So yeah, how did that right. come about? Yeah, so basically um, I've been an MP for two years now. Yep. Um, so in my first year, um, I, I quite quickly realized that as a member of parliament, um, you, you're you in the 
um, you know, you have the unique privilege of having a, a helicopter view of the whole region. Yeah. And for me, it's Hamilton and sort of Lucy, the whole the Waikato region. And so I was meeting with businesses. Um, I was meeting with with um, key leaders in, in various industries across the city. Uh, and, and, and I was seeing all the incredible growth that was taking place. Um, and so I was hearing all these good stories in various areas, you know, whether it's construction, IT, um, you know, dairy industries, um, tourism. So I was hearing all these stories and sort of seeing it firsthand. But I sort of felt that, that it wasn't filtering down to, you know, people on the street who are just sort of getting on with their lives. Yeah, there's a lot of people that don't know stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, even like the uh, regional theatre, a lot of people still don't know anything about that, and we can maybe touch on that later if, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you're interested. But yeah, so 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 I basically I thought, well, look, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'd like to provide some briefings for people mm-hmm. so, that, so they get the same briefings that I get. Um, and so the first one uh, was in, in February... Um, this year, and and it was on the Hamilton to Auckland corridor, which is the biggest piece of planning work that this region's ever seen. So it's basically it's basically mapping the growth between Cambridge and Tiamudu in the south up yep. to Pukekohe in the north, and it's basically mapping out you know fifty fifty to a hundred years of growth. You know, so where the cities are going to grow, where the transport links will go, where the schools, hospitals will go, um, where it's good for cities to grow and where it's not so good, you know, depending on the, the uh, land, you know, flood prone areas, you know, this is good areas, um, you know, how cities can grow up as well as out. Uh, yeah, so it's a piece of work with um, 30 government agencies involved in it, um, as well as councils um, and iwi. And, and also we just... It's just gone out to stakeholders, you know, so um, key businesses who can build the infrastructure. Yeah. And and, and we had about 150 people um, up, up at Wintech, and I thought, oh, maybe there is interest here. The next one was on construction sector. Um, so Leonard Gardner from Foster Construction, who's currently got 37 um, construction projects on across the region. So he came and shared his story. Yeah. And, and, and Matt Stark, who many people know, he's a developer in town. He's been beautifying the city. And we had over 200 people to that event. Yeah. And I thought, okay, the interest is there. Following that, we had um, we did one on the the IT sector. We've had the the fastest growing IT sector in, in New Zealand for the past two years, um, and um, and then the other one was the various dairy industries, sheep milk, goat milk, Fonterra, and then the last one we just had um, was, was around tourism, some of the key tourism projects. So I, I think it's been really successful, um, and and um, and I've had some good comments, good feedback from it, and we get a different audience every time. You know, depending on. I've been a couple of times, yeah, yeah, and I do notice that the audience is different. Mm, yeah, yeah. I did. I was talking to Daniel Hopper the other oh, day. Oh yeah, I know Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that um, he made a joke actually that you you took his idea of LinkedIn and applied it to the Grow Waikato. <laughs> I said to Daniel actually when I was thinking of doing the Grow Waikato thing, I said to Daniel, I said, oh look, um, look, um, I because I had been to one of his LinkedIn events. Um, I actually spoke at one of them. Um, and oh, did he, you? He, had, he had five speakers about five minutes each and um, and, I, and I thought man that was good I really enjoyed it and then I actually said to him I said oh look um, I'm I'm um, thinking of of um, doing you know this Grow Waikato event you know first of all first of all what do you think secondly I don't want to step on your toes <laughs> thirdly have you got any advice and um, uh, he basically said to me he said look look the, the, the uh, more events of this type that we have out there you know, to get messages out across the region is a, a um, good thing. So I still support his events. He he supports mine, and yeah, um, and, and and I mean, I mean, like the uh, key message is that there's heaps of great stories to tell within our region, and and I think that people, um, you know, we haven't we haven't been as proud of our region in the past. Um, well, yeah, Hamilton, than we be. Hamilton in particular has a bit of a negative stereotype. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm originally from Auckland, and when I said I was moving down here. You know, I got so people much. think you're crazy. Yeah, yeah, well, I got a lot of crap from a lot of people, you know, for moving here. Yeah. So yeah. like, it, it's a matter of changing that perception, right? It is. It is, and the perception, and 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 it's starting to change. It really is. I mean, my wife and I came over from. I mean, I. I, I grew up here, Hamilton, but then my wife and I were living in Tauranga and we came back 2006 and people thought we were crazy, you know, coming to Hamilton. Yeah. But uh, interestingly, um, we're getting a lot of Aucklanders come down to live here. And, yeah. And, and I think I'll be inter- I mean, I'm interested in, in um, your story, but I think that some of the key drivers I've seen, um, uh, number one is around transport. Um, it's a lot easier to get around the city. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like the, the city's actually... 
it's designed a lot better than, say, Auckland or even Tauranga, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. part of that, obviously, might be because it's an inland city. Yep. You know, yep. Auckland sits on an isthmus and yeah. Tauranga has two harbours as well. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when I first moved here, I think I gained a three hours extra a day. Wow. So... I was actually bored at first. I had to find more stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, and if you think of the lack of productivity, um, you know, for New Zealand Inc., people sitting on motorways in Auckland, it's it's not good. And so, yeah, certainly, tra- certainly transport. Um, you know, the other one that, that there are lots of really good schools down here. So people with children, you know, there's heap, heaps of great schooling options, mm. um, and just really good, good, good um, livability. Um, you know, he- heaps of business opportunities. Lots of businesses are coming down. Um, you're very central. You know, so it's, it's only like it's an hour and a half to fifty percent of the population. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep, and and we're part of that golden triangle. You know. Where, yeah, yeah. You know, where 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 most of the economic growth in New Zealand is happening within that triangle between Auckland, Hamilton, and Tauranga. So we're we're very well situated. Um, I actually um, I was in the paper the other day saying that I think we'll be the second biggest city in New I Zealand. I saw in that. Yeah, you got mainstream attention for that. <laughs> I mean, it was probably a little little bit um, provocative. Um, but was that exactly what you said, or did the media slightly? No, no, it? that's what I said. That's, that's what I exactly said. what you said. I said I said um, that um, I believe we can be. The second biggest city. Right. In, okay, in yeah, because that's 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 the key. Yeah, key words yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, us politicians, be. us yeah. politicians, learn to soften things. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what I said anyway. But I mean, I mean, like the reality is, um, and you alluded to before, to it before, um, we can grow easily um, because we, we, you know, we're not constrained by by geography, like 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 Wellington, Tauranga, um, Auckland. Auckland are. Yeah, so so we can grow out easily. Um, it, um, but if we, we can also grow up, and, and that's that's one of the keys. Yeah, because I think, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how often you've been overseas, but I find every time I go overseas, you look at how they've constructed their cities and they build up, but yeah. we tend to build out. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's part of the problem as to why Auckland's traffic is as bad as it is. It is, 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yep. we never built up, we just kept yeah. building further and further out. Yeah, yeah that's and right. And then as a result of that, I would imagine you'd have to you'd have to invest more money into public transport and mm-hmm. the, the you know the buses and the trains have to go a further distance to yep. commute into the city yeah that's right i mean you're losing and you're losing productive land as well yeah you know which which should be you really used to produce food mm. um i mean the example of um, pukekohe is some of the the best soil in new zealand uh, probably in the world actually and um and the auckland council is looking to you know, to um, build there, um, a city sort of half the size of Hamilton um, on on that land, which seems ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it does. So at, actually, as a government, we've um, we've we just putting some legislation through around around protecting elite soils. Um, you know, because we we recognise, um, particularly in that example yeah. and, and other examples. I mean, I mean, like you can grow out to a point, but you must also grow up. Certainly, and, it, and I'm encouraged to see what's happening in the CBD with, with the apartments going in in terms of Hamilton CBD. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, and I think we're certainly going to see we're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah. So, fast forward sort of 10, 15 years, the uh, northern part of the CBD will be full of apartments, um, and then the southern part of the CBD will be the actual CBD. You know, we obviously we have a theatre there as well as all the you know. Is there a bit the, of a uh, push? Is there a bit of a push and pull between central government and? Um, oh yeah, government? certainly. Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, since I've been in 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 government, we've been working really well with with council. Mm. Um, at times, um, central government and various councils across the country uh, have a have a difference of opinion. But I think that uh, that um, generally speaking, the relationship is is um, was well, uh, certainly has been good in the last two years. That's all I can really speak of. Um, most of the councils I talk to, they're, they're really happy with the the, uh, the the level of collaboration, you know, between between central and local government. And as an example, locally here, um, the the uh, Peacocks development, um, which is where the government's invested two hundred million uh, to unlock uh, around ten thousand houses in the south of the city. Yeah, yeah. So that's been a great example of collaboration. Um, and then Hamilton City get gets one hundred and ten million in NZTA subsidies, and they don't have to pay back. How much of a role did you play in that? Uh, not much not myself much. because that was um, the, it, it was basically it was basically discussed under the previous government but not signed off. Um, so the previous government 
um, the previous National League government and and our council, um, you know, sort of talked through it and wrote up the plans. Mm. And then it was just sitting there. And then when our government came in, uh, basically we we had a look at it. We had a we had a talk to Hamilton City Council, and we decided to sign it off. Yeah, which is so it, it, um, two hundred million interest free, and then one hundred and ten million NZTA subsidy. So it, it's certainly a really good deal for the city. Um, yeah, yeah. Ar- around that infrastructure. Are you one of the key personnel though that provides intel to Jacinda about what's going on in the Waikato? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, she seems uh, to be down here quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, but she certainly has been recently. Um, I mean, she was here um, about four weeks ago to turn the sod on a ninety million dollar par project up that, at the university. Yep, I saw that. And then, um, and, and and then to announce a hundred million dollar building of of the new um, well, a rebuild of the Henry Henry Rongamo Bennett Centre, which is a mental health facility. Yeah. And then and then one which um, um, yeah, which I think is particularly exciting. Is um, the regional theatre? The regional theatre, yeah. About um, two weeks ago, so so I guess using the regional theatre as an example of what I do, um, you know, I knew that this project was underway. Um, I spoke to the key people involved, um, particularly Momentum Group, and we decided to pitch to the provincial growth fund, um, which would be government money. Uh, the whole project was seventy five million. Um, so um, at that point. Uh, about 50 had been raised, maybe 55 million had been raised. So we decided to pitch, you know, make a pitch to the Provincial Growth Fund uh, for, for $15 million. Um, and and I was involved in that pitch and I, I uh, lobbied the ministers. Um, when the Prime Minister was here, um, which is about, about sort of six, seven months ago, I took her to the site and I showed her, I said, this is where the theatre, this is where we want to build it, this is what we want to do, we're just casting the vision. She was like, yep, yeah, yeah, I get it, you know. And then... Um, yeah, and and then we were fortunate enough to get to get the money. We didn't we didn't get the fifteen, but we we got twelve, which is great. You know, it's a grant; we don't have to pay it back, and that was enough for the project to go live. Um, so cause construction will start early next year. I think there's still a bit of misinformation that's going out there, though, or there's some misinformation, or people have some idea that you know all this where the tax the taxpayer is paying all this all this which isn't the case do you get frustrated yeah. when you're seeing stuff on facebook because i know how active yeah. you are on social media yeah how active you are and and when you're looking scrolling through comments and people are saying yeah. things that are incorrect because i get yeah. annoyed and i'm not even a politician <laughs> <laughs> yeah i do i do i mean it comes with the territory though doesn't it It sort of does come with the territory um and i mean look i I, I certainly pre- appreciate people's opinions, um, um, you know, particularly if they have a, a constructive nature. Um, but like some people, you know, they're very ideologically opposed, um, uh, and so it's, it's it's very difficult to ever probably see eye to eye. I mm. mean, like I mean, like you know, it, as an example, some people would, you know, would think that we should have you know small government, low taxes, low rates. And then, and then, and then, like you pay for everything. So you know, like you uh, pay for your water, you pay to use the roads, you pay for, um, you know, uh, all of those. You know, you pay for your education, you pay for your health, but like over in the states. Yeah. Whereas um, another philosophy, which is more the current government's philosophy, you know, is around um, the 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 collective. You know, so we all, you know, we all put money in, and then we all we all get rewards back. So I mean, like for some people, it's just you just we, we're just never going to see eye to eye. Well, but no, look, you won't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's but just the way it works. I mean, in, in terms in terms of the misinformation, yeah, the the, the theatre was an example of that. Um, and I said to the Waikato Times reporter when she ran the story, I said, I said, look, can you please put the breakdown of of where this money's coming from for the theatre? Um, and and I'm um, credit to her, she did. Um, and and so did Thomas Rowland from the, the from the Herald. So you know the Times and the Herald both did the breakdown, which um, yeah, which is good because it, I mean you know it shows twenty five million from city council, five million from regional council, fif- uh, fifteen million from a trust, you know a uh, local trust, uh, which is um, Trust Waikato. I think another sort of um, maybe two or three million from various other trusts, and then sort of five to ten million or so from philanthropists. And, mm. and then the government money, uh, yeah. So it's it's uh, very much a, a collaboration, very much a partnership. You know, similar t- to the um, trained Auckland, you know, which was um, seventy million from the government and ten million from the various councils. I think because one of the problems is public transport in New Zealand is not the greatest. I mean, mm. you go anywhere overseas, it's not that great. 
And I think, so let's take Auckland, for example. I think part of the problem there is if you want to work in Auckland, you have to live in Auckland. Mm. So if there was like a, because I think with the upper North Island, a lot of these towns and cities are in close proximity with each other. So if there was a, a high-speed rail network, then mm. it would allow people to have more alternatives or, yeah. or more options yeah, in terms of right. where they work. Yep. Is that is that where you see the potential of the the corridor? Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, I mean, the, the uh, corridor, like you mentioned, it's it's already the busiest corridor in New Zealand um, mm. around traffic movements, uh, movement of freight, trade, people movements, um, and it's only going to going to become busier. Uh, but basically, what you're seeing with with the expressway almost finished, so with the Huntley section opening. Um, it's February, isn't it? February, yeah. yeah. And that was an interesting collaboration. The previous government put in around a billion. We've put in a billion. So it's basically a, a $2 billion project, you know, $1 billion from each each government, um, which is a good example of, of, of uh, collaboration. So anyway, that's going to open in February, um, that section between, between um, you'll be able to go from Hamilton north. The, the section curving around the city is still another couple of years away. But, yeah. But that main section to Auckland will open in February. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and so when you put the, the passenger rail alongside it, which will open in July, and and, and that's a start. Um, I think some people think that it's permanently going to stay that way, but what yeah. I see with rail is the long-term investment. Yeah, long-term investment, certainly. So, I, I mean, like we're starting a service in July, and, and, and it, it is going to be good service. It's going to, it's going to be reliable. It's going to be comfortable. Um, half the seats will have tables so you can get your laptop out, you can work, there'll be Wi-Fi, there'll be a cafe. Um, it won't be super fast and part of that is because the trains have to slow down through the swamp. Um, well, it, like, there's wait, a wait, swamp it up around Medi Medi. Yeah, but yeah. I think I think I saw in the proposal originally that there would be uh, an upgrade to it at some point like to get tilt trains so yeah, yeah. you don't have that problem. That's certainly a possibility, yeah. But the, the, the uh, big piece of work as well is that the Ministry of Transport um, uh, are undergoing, well, they're, they're undertaking a business case for rapid rail, which would be one hour between both CBDs. So it'll be... That like, would be amazing. You know, like, that'll be your fast rail. And that will absolutely link the two labour markets. They'll effectively become one labour market and, and our businesses will, will, um, will um, locate anywhere, anywhere along that corridor they want to really and have access to all, the, all, all that labour. So what does that depend on? That becoming a reality, the whole one hour between. The okay, two so cities? yeah, so a, a business case will come out in April next year. Um, we'll see what the cost is. Yeah, I expect it'll be probably around five billion. Um, so what, the, what what would most of the cost be? Just building the line, I guess. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you're building the line will be. Um, I mean, like you have to buy the land, you know, from from people. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, unless it can go alongside the expressway. Um, so, because uh, I'd imagine there'd be part of the problem is because the Waikato, a lot of it is swampy area. Yeah, to that's build right. the um, the infrastructure there would be yeah. quite costly. Yeah, that's right. You know, so you have to dig down quite deep and put a lot of sand and a lot of a lot of stone. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, in hindsight, it would have been great if a corridor was set aside um, for rail when the expressway was built. So you wouldn't even have to build the tracks, but just you know, like a while NZTA were were uh, procuring the land, just just procure an extra sort of you know um, five meter corridor at that time, so that land is there. Um, and yeah, but um, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, that yeah, so basically the business case will come out in April, and and we'll um, see what they say. Uh, if it is around that sort of five billion mark, or so it will certainly be well into the billions at some point there. Um, then the question is how how could it be financed? Um, and and um, how could it be financed? Yeah, and, and, and so some of the answers to that, as I see it, um, could potentially be the New Zealand Super Fund, uh, which is a fund that's got forty billion dollars in it, owned by New Zealanders. Um, oh wow! Okay. ACC have got forty billion dollar fund as well. Um, KiwiSaver has got a thirty billion dollar fund. So that's about $115 billion worth of money. Now, those funds invest in infrastructure projects around the world, mm -hmm. and, and some of them, um, are particularly ACC, they also invest in New Zealand. So one of, them could, one of those funds could see this as like a 50-year investment. So they invest the money to build it, um, and then they run it for 50 years, 
you know, bring in all the all, all the the uh, ticket prices, you know, working with government on it, working with council on it, and that's one example of a model that could potentially work. Yeah, how long would it take though? Do you think to build? Yeah, are we talking uh, I three think, years, four I, years? I think you'd be looking at. Um, at least probably five years. Five years. Um, if you look at the CRL, you know the the um, city rail link. City rail link. Yeah. So that's due to open in twenty twenty four, and when did they start that? Maybe two years ago. I think I was still in Auckland when they even started. <laughs> yeah, I think it would have been. <laughs> I mean, that's an impressive project. Um, we, we 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 had an update on it um, uh, from the CRL board just recently in Parliament, but yeah, that I mean that's six or seven years. There but are, wouldn't a lot of the problem with that would would be though because it's. You're having to build underground yeah, and there's already yeah. infrastructure and pipes and yeah you're basically tunneling think, yeah. for about what maybe 10 kilometers or something because that would be more expensive CBD. than just building a, a rail line wouldn't it yes yes uh well but it's over a greater distance I oh, no, in terms of expense um not sure actually because i mean that the, the crl is four billion four to five billion so it might be similar I mean, well, you know, we can guess, only we can only speculate, but you know, but I'm really looking forward to seeing that business case come out. Um, so, if the, let's say hypothetically that the train is like a roaring success from the get go, would that mm-hmm. fast track? The I think so. I think it would. Yeah, yeah. I think that it it would give some confidence to to to, to, uh, to potential investors. Yeah. Um, whether it's one of the funds or whether 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 it's government potentially, but it'll it'll give confidence um, around a business model. You know that that uh, that 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 would provide a return. Because what are the concerns that it won't get used? Is that one of the the concerns by investors oh, look, currently? Uh, you, you mean the yeah the, the, in terms the, of the the, the service the service um, yeah. Yep. Yes, that's right. Um, I mean, like some people do say that. You know, I mean, like some people believe that you know that that it won't work. I have a different view. I think that it will work. I think that we've come to a point in our our um, evolution as as New Zealanders that that you know that we re- we we we, we recognise the importance of rail. You know, many of us have travelled overseas and and used so trains. Good. I mean, I was I was over in London recently. The underground is yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah, and and I believe we 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 have the population base um, within that golden triangle. To make it work, you know, for it to work, because that's that's part of the problem, right? Because of our low population, mm. because yeah, yeah, with rail, you don't usually make money from it, and t- from a physical standpoint, it's more mm. the productivity aspect. It's the productivity aspect, absolutely. You can hop on the train, you can start work, and you can work all the way to Auckland, you can work all the way back. Yeah. Now, um, I mean, um, governments tend to subsidise rail. Yeah. And and over over in China, where they've got you know, like most of the fast trains in the world, that was almost completely government funded and government subsidised. But you see, if you got people on on rail, then those people aren't on the road. You know, so there's less accidents, um, less wear and tear on the road. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, there's, you know, the, the the cost benefit analysis is certainly certainly worth looking at in, in terms of passenger rail. Yeah. I think some some of the concern is though because the trains often break down just in Auckland standard yeah. trains. I remember when I lived there. I mean, I didn't catch the train personally, yeah. But there'd be often people that would come late to work because the train had broken down, and this was a regular occurrence. So yeah. I think as a result of that, some people don't have much confidence. Like imagine if you yeah. if you were yeah. taking the train from Hamilton to Auckland for work, you know, yeah. In a best case scenario, and then the train broke down. Yeah, no, that, be, that's a good be, point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, um, you know, um, Kiwi Rail, um, who 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 would be running the service, they have been working really hard on this, um, and and they've sort of come from from quite a low base, so um, you know, going back sort of thirty, forty, probably even fifty years, um, governments generally haven't invested in rail. It's been all roads, really. Yeah, we seem to be one of the, you know, most car reliable countries in the yeah, world yeah that's right yeah i mean we, we we had rail and all the tracks were built you know sort of um what early 1900s to yeah. sort of mid 1900s um, but then there was certainly a move away from rail and and so kiwi rail um had been running on the smell of an oily rag you know for oh, for yeah. years now yeah but this new government we, we allocated one billion dollars in the in in the last budget for kiwi rail 
Um, and and so we're saying to them, look, look, we we uh, we uh, value you, you know, we you know we value the importance of rail, but we've got to put our money where our mouth is um, and give them the, the the investment that they need to do it well. So I I I, um, I think we've turned a corner um, in terms of rail, and yep. so it'll it'll certainly be be uh, very interesting, but. I mean, I mean, like you're right though that the service must be reliable, absolutely, because because one of the key aspects as well is certainty of arrival time. So if you're a business person, at, at, at the moment, you know, you go to Auckland, you've got a meeting at say uh, nine a.m. Um, you you know you can't bank on leaving at seven thirty and taking you an hour and a half, um, but even six thirty, you know, two and a half hours. A lot of people even find that you know it's quite unpredictable. Yeah, on that I mean, motorway. I've driven I've driven up to Auckland. For like a nine a.m. meeting yeah. or something, yeah, and you have to leave at like six thirty or yeah, exactly. And yeah. even then, you're still thinking, "Heck, I hope, I hope, I, I hope, hope I get there. I hope <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. no." And if there's a crash, yeah, yeah. So say goodbye to getting to your meeting. Yeah, exactly. And so if you're, you know, if you're taking the train instead, um, you know, you'd, you know, I think the times are going to be six o'clock and seven o'clock. So you, you could pick one of those. Um, you know, you know, you hop on the train. There's a cafe there. You get yourself a coffee. You sit down. You put it on the table. Open your laptop. You know, you can you can do a bit of work, or you you, you know you can, you can you can watch a movie or something or whatever you want to do. Have a sleep, um, and 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 you've got certainty of arrival time. You know exactly when you'll be at at um, Brito Mart, and then you can make your meeting. So, I mean, it, it's not going to suit everyone, depending on where you're going in Auckland. Um, but but I think it'll suit a lot of people. And it was interesting. I was I, I was at Fonterra, um, Fonterra's Hamilton office um, about two months ago, and and uh, the yeah, the government relations person there put out an email to all of their staff. They got about um, about fifteen hundred staff there, saying who's interested in the passenger rail. Let me know. She thought she'd have maybe fifty or hundred replies back. She had six hundred people reply. So wow. almost half of her staff replied to the email saying yes, very interested. Um, you know, um, I I'll, I'll want to know more about it, and so, and so the key is um, is getting some of those those big businesses on board. So, say for example, Fonterra may, you know, may choose to buy buy um twenty tickets, you know, every every trip, and then work with their staff around the scheduling of their meetings. Um, uh, you know, because I hear from a lot of employers, particularly for people who are commuting up to Auckland or coming commuting down here, um, the staff get really tired. Particularly if they're working Monday to Friday, come Thursday, Friday, you know they're. It's actually quite tiring really mentally. To, yeah. To drive. Exactly. Especially that distance. Yep. And if yep. you're doing it on your own as well, you're not yeah. even That's talking right. to anyone to yeah. keep your energy level up. So. And and, and, it, and it can become dangerous as well. So it's um. Yeah. So I I believe that the time has come, um, and certainly looking forward to it opening. Actually, we're actually um, the the uh, station uh, at, at Rotokari, which is just behind the base. So um, construction will start on that station soon. Um, I thought it was supposed to happen sometime this month. Uh, yeah, I believe it. I believe it will be this month. Yep. Yeah, I'm actually just going back and forth with council at the moment. Just you know, you know, just just sort of settling that. How much back and forth do you guys do? Like, if you're trying yeah, to decide, quite a bit. yeah, if you're just with one thing, yeah, like how much back and forth is there, and <laughs> over what period of time? Uh, so let's say with like the, like with the rail, the rail, yeah, like yeah. How how long were these talks? How long were they going on for? Okay, um, so basically, well, I mean the, you know the the uh, train service will start in July next year, and the discussions started in earnest. Uh, that would have been early two thousand and eighteen. So what's that? Nineteen twenty. That, that it's over two years. It's a long talk, yeah. time for talks. And, and in terms of the talks. They were probably one year, and then and then now we're you know we're getting the service going. So the, the carriages have been refurbished. You know the mm. work's been done on the tracks. The stations have been built. But in terms of talks, yep, yeah, that, that would have been a year. And and basically that was around settling how it's going to be paid for, basically. And so it um, settled at um, around seventy million from NZTA. Which is New Zealand Transport Association, which is a government agency, yeah, and then around ten million from Waikato Regional Council, Waikato District Council, and Hamilton City Council, and the majority of that ten million um, uh, was around building stations at building station at Rotokari and, and, right. and a station at Huntley. 
So I mean, I mean, like the talks are around business cases. A business case is done first, and then, um, and then, and then people like aspects of it. Well, when I say people, you know, the the, the elected members yep. like aspects. Take that out, put that in, change that. Can you make that cheaper? Uh, what if we invested more here? And there's a lot of back and forward. So um, how many how many uh, representatives of Labour are at these meetings? Or is it just you mainly talking to all these councils? Uh, myself and, and Minister Phil Twyford. So he's the oh, Minister yeah. of Transport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it was mainly the two of us. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, like a basically Minister Twyford would, would, would um, give the direction, you know, so he said, he, he basically said, we want the train, you know, we want the passenger rail. And then so the council, but, you know, he said, he, it, yeah, he basically said that we, we, we want the train, but the government won't pay for all of it. We want councils to have skin in the game. Um, Which is fair enough. And then so and, and so the councils went away and they worked out how much they could each invest um, and they had their discussions and then they came back and there was a bit of toing and froing and yeah and, and and obviously the business case is going on at the same time and yeah. So how does the government decide where to allocate funding to anything go right? Because if yeah. if you're allocating funding to one thing, you're usually mm-hmm. taken away from something else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's like a seesaw. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, uh, that's where you come down. You know, you come down to to, uh, to the election promises. You know, so during the election in two thousand seventeen, the Labor government said that that uh, that that will get. Well, sorry, the Labor Party, I should say, Labor Party said that we will get um, passenger rail going between Hamilton and Auckland, um, and so that was a pre-campaign promise. But when you're making these campaign promises, are you fully aware? Of the cost. Of the cost and how yeah. feasible it is. Yeah. Or are you just kind of, this is what we'd like to do. Yeah. But we're yeah. not actually sure if we can do it. Yeah. Because I think this is the biggest complaint people have about not just labor, yeah. but any yeah. party. You know, they make all these promises and then they feel let down. Yeah. Yeah. I know that they certainly are costed. Um, so each each party will have, uh, will have, will have an independent accountant, um, you know, do their, do their costings. The tricky thing is that it's based on projections of GDP growth and, and projections of the uh, tax take. So if, uh-huh. if the tax take changes, um, you know, so you know the government don't bring in as much tax as they thought for whatever reason, whether it's a business downturn, then obviously things have to change. But it's but yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, like a based on projections, yeah. No, and and, and so when when um, Labor you know got into coalition with New Zealand First. And then the Green Party in confidence and supply, there's a, a a manifesto was produced, and so Labor's policies went into it. New Zealand First policies went into it. There was a there was a you know there there, there were obviously negotiations. Some policies dropped out. Yeah. Um. That was just the way it was. Uh, other policies got in, and that's the manifesto that over the three years we are just basically working our way through bit by bit, basically delivering that manifesto. Because politics is ex- extremely complex, and I think a lot of um, everybody seems to have an opinion on politics, but most people yeah. don't even probably know what they're talking about, myself yeah. included. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, how do you guys actually even get the word out? To, to because it's so complex to try and condense it. I mean, I see Jacinda on you know radio and media, and yeah. she's got like three minutes to convey, yeah, you know, a whole bunch of policies, which seems like a difficult task. Yeah, it is. It is, um, and so we tend to talk in, in a high level. I mean, I mean, like basically, what we, what what are we believe that we're doing at a high level is um, is basically making up for nine years of underinvestment, particularly in health and education, some of that sort of social stuff. And so you've seen a lot of investment in health, a lot in education, and a lot in infrastructure. Mm. Um, and so that's sort of our high level message that we've, we've um, started the journey. Um, of of investing in those in those key places, um, but there are people that have almost like a sense of loyalty to their party, right? So yeah, like yeah. modern day tribalism. Yeah. So you might have people that are very loyal to Labour, and people yeah. who are very loyal to National, yeah. and no matter what you say, no matter what, yeah, they're going to yeah. criticise it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. Yep. And sometimes they're in the media, <laughs> but I won't mention names. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and and so I suppose what you do in a campaign is you speak to the undecided voters, um, and you you know and you try and work out what makes them tick and what is it that they want because they're the people who effectively decide the election, 
you know, um, the, 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 the people who maybe vote national for a while, they like John Key, now they like Jacinda, they've come over to Labour, um, uh, you know, they might have been with New Zealand First at one point, they might have even been a Green at one point. Yeah. Um, you know, so that that's the key voter area who, who yeah. Well, it's a matter of decide the election. I suppose catering to the middle class because they are the yeah. majority, right? Yeah, yeah, the middle. You know, the the stereotype is that national. You know, they cater to the upper class and labour cater to the lower class, but it's actually yeah. the middle class, which is the huge bulk of the country. Yeah, that's right. Yep, certainly. Yeah. Um, and then um, and and then interesting conversations around youth. You know, because youth um, traditionally haven't voted in as high a um, no. haven't had a, as high a turnout as as well. They aren't interested. Others. That's the problem. Yeah. So the question there is, how do you engage them? Um, and, and we we had a little bit of a bump, um, uh, probably down to Jacinda. Um, you know, more than anything. Yeah. Well, she's probably the most popular New Zealand Prime Minister in the history. Yeah, I, look, in history, on a, on, a, on a global scale. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like everybody knows who she is. Yeah. No, she does. I mean, I, I mean, they do. I was over in the UK. Um, in July, and um, yeah, almost everyone over there, as soon as they heard us from New Zealand, New Zealand, they said, oh, Jacinda. Whereas it used to be, oh, you're from New Zealand, oh, the All Blacks. Yeah. But now it's Jacinda. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, she's she's very, very well known. On Does a, she get um, stopped? Because obviously she's been down here quite a bit. Does she get stopped yeah. when she's walking around and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, when she was down here to announce the 12 million for the theatre, we had to walk from, from the theatre to a business. Uh, which was normally take you maybe about two minutes. Um, talk about fifteen or twenty minutes. People just just people just like are running out of um, <laughs> you know um, uh, shops and you know you know um, bars and eateries just running out. Really? Onto Can I get a photo? Get a selfie? Selfie? So you just slowly yeah yeah. <laughs> but so just, do you have to if you have meetings and stuff? Do you have to try and keep it under under the radar so like people don't swarm her? Uh, yeah, I mean, like her car has tinted windows, um, and so <laughs> I hope she doesn't have like her face on it, like nah, like you, me. You, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, 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 definitely yeah. not. <laughs> My subtle branding. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, but no, she's um, yeah, she, she certainly is very popular. Um, but but I think the key thing is people see her as being quite genuine. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. And, and and she's able to engage. You know, she you know she can engage with uh, with a wide range of people. You know, she can go and, and I've seen her do this. You know, like um you know speak to a business audience at that level, talking about investment infrastructure. You know, uh, you know you know um, the, the the international markets, and then and then go to a meeting with a group of a group of young people and yeah. completely change her language. You know, but but completely connect. But there'll be certain aspects of the media, right, that will just criticise her no matter... Like, I'm going to use a name here, like Mike Hosking. He's very much national-focused, yeah. so he'll spin any narrative mm. to to make Jacinda look in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a negative way. But how do you guys try to push forward through that and mm. make sure that the, the right message is getting across mm. with all the, you know, the yeah. child's play you know, yeah, like, that the different parties and yeah, different media personnel ha have. Yeah, you would hope the media would be unbiased. Um, it's very difficult though, because eh? yeah. we're all biased in a sense, aren't we? Yeah, we. I think that we are. Um, I think that um, you know, there's an interesting discussion there um, around publicly funded news media and then privately funded. So, for example, public funded, you got Radio New Zealand, um, yeah, who certainly are, you know, down the middle. Um, TVNZ, I think, you know, generally down the middle. The other media outlets, I mean, I mean, I'm technically, they can do what they want, um, but you would hope that for the listeners' sake, that they would be unbiased. But um, even if, like, say, a company is unbiased, mm. the individual might be biased. Like, yeah, say, if you have yeah, a media right. personality. Yeah, their, yeah, their views will still cater. Yeah, yeah, that's to, right. Yeah, to a different, to a particular audience, you know. You know, but that person has to be careful because you know the audience out there is going to be, um, you know, a, 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 you know, there's going to be quite a diverse audience, and if yeah. they want to keep that audience, they do have to be, you know, they they, they do have to think that through. Well, I try to be very objective. I mean, I covered yeah. a lot of the local politicians when they were oh, here. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I had very interest, interesting chats with all of them. Mm. And I was trying to be 
objective, which I think I was. I think I was. <laughs> I'm sure you were. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's like because I don't. It, I'm providing a service to the people, and then it's up yeah. to them to decide. Yeah. Yeah. How they feel. I just don't like it yeah. when people are saying this is how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Like a black and white approach when actually there's a lot of shades of grey. Yeah, and I think that if people who are in the public eye do that too much, then people then people don't respect them as much. Yeah. And they can, um, you know, and they can sort of lose a lot of um, a lot of the respect that they have, and and they they can often even become marginalised at times. Um, and then if you know, um, which, which which is not not good for someone's career, really, to be honest. No, it's not. But it's the age of social media as well, and everyone has an opinion and has to give their opinion on everything. Yeah, and and the other thing as well is um, really interesting around the post truth world that we that that we're sort fake of living. News. Maybe, yeah. Fake news. So, I mean, I mean, like I think that's that's quite fascinating. Uh, you know, where someone can just just put something up on social media that can be a hundred percent false, and it can go viral, and then and then the person who may have been been uh, vilified. Mm. Um, they put their statement out, which is the truth, which is the correct statement. Um, but that statement doesn't get the same, you know, the, the, the same coverage that the false statement does. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I've seen some things on Facebook when I'm scrolling through my news feed and it might come up with something about Jacinda and I'm like, mm. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not correct. But the best way to find out is if you Google it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can Usually normally... nothing will come up related to that particular point. Yeah, yeah. So that's the best way to know if it's fake there news. There you go. Yeah, yeah, I do worry about about the fake news aspect. Um, do you guys ever talk about it in caucus? Yeah, we do, we do. I mean, it's. Uh, the, I guess the question is how do you respond to it? Mm. Um, you know, do you just sort of take a, you know, um, a, a higher approach and, and just and, and basically just, just call it out for what it is? Um, but then just move on and tell your story, um, you know, or do you get down in the weeds with that? Yeah. Um, and that, and that's sort of the big question. I mean, it was interesting, um, you know, um, uh, there's been a couple of elections recently that I've observed where, where, uh, fake news has played quite a key role in the result of that election. So yeah. it'll be interesting, um, to see with the election coming next year, um, hopefully fake news doesn't play a role, and um, hopefully people can see through that. But hopefully, but you just don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, hey, I know you got to get going, but um, thanks for coming through. It's, it's, it took a while to get you here, but I finally got you here. Oh, thank you so much. That's all right. Yeah, we'll yeah. have to do this again at some point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, look, I'll, I'll be very happy to come back um, maybe next year when the election's on. Yeah, um, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Cool. But if um. Anybody wants to get in contact with you in regards to Grow Waikato or yeah, yep, yep. What's, so, what's the best way to do that? Okay, so in, in, in terms of Grow Waikato, we've got um, so we'll have uh, we, we've got three dates booked in for next year, yep. early next year. So the first one will probably be around big events, so a briefing on field days, balloons over Waikato, maybe the sevens, you know, some of those big events. Yep. And then we're also looking at one on transport. Um, you know, which would be what's happening in the region around roading, around rail, um, around inland ports, you know, movement of freight, and probably another one on on education. So those would probably be the first three. And if any of those topics interest, interest any of your listeners, um, the best way is to email my, my EA, Melissa. So it's Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot white, W-H-I-T-E, at parliament dot G-O-V-T dot N-Z. Cool. So if you email Melissa White or call her on 07-839-6803. Okay, I'll, that, I'll, in, I'll include the details on include the YouTube details. and, and yeah, cool. Apple and all that stuff. Cheers. Cool. All right. Well, that's the show, guys. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe. Great. Cheers.